And we are live. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us on Mental Shift, the first live recording of my podcast that I have done in over three years. The first live. Why is Michelle doing the first live of Mental Shift? Well, first of all, who's Michelle? If you're on my page, you probably know who I am. I'm an international speaker, coach, uh, author, and the host of this podcast, Mental Shift. Why did I create Mental Shift? Mental Shift occurred after I had a uh, radio show on KCMJ 93.9. And I had a radio show there. And then I realized, you know, I wanted to have more people on that could share their story to a broader audience. And so I moved it to a podcast and called it Mental Shift because what I found was every time I had anyone on my show, they all had had some shift in their lives that um, caused them to do something completely different in their world. Now, I met, oh, Jeanette says, hi, Michelle and Gail. Hello, Jeanette. And so when I was introduced to Gail, who you're about to meet, uh, I was just dumbfounded. And it's really hard to do that for me because um, I'm kind of hyper anyways. But then I met someone who was probably more hyper than me, more goofy than me, and has gone through so much and smiles through everything. And she's just an amazing human. I want you all to meet Gail Hamilton. She's got a website called uh, www.soaringintogreatness. She's got this really cool book that she sent me and had the nerve to ask me if I finished reading it after four days. Uh, please check out the thickness of it. It is a good it two, two inches thick, but Gail wrote this awesome book and the stories are amazing from what I've gotten through. And I promise you, I will finish it, Gail. So please welcome the author, the, the uh, inspirational speaker, the singer, the musician, the piano player, Gail Hamilton. Good morning. Hi, thank you for being having me on your show. How cool is that? <laughs> It's pretty cool, Gail. I'm so glad you're with me because, you know, I'm, I'm basically torturing you because I put you on live air and uh, because I wanted to share with you, the world, you, uh, when I met you, you said, what, but I said, um, would you rather be called, what, are you blind or visually impaired? And what did you say? God only knows. Um <laughs> I don't know what I said. You I'm, said I'm, I'm blind. blind. There's definitely anything. That's right. I am. I'm not visually impaired for sure. If if I don't know what people's visual acuity is, then I say visually impaired. But for me, I am blind as blind as you can get. <laughs> and the thing is, and, and this is what's so amazing about Gail. She says, "I'm blind as blind as you can get." When you pick up her book. She has it on Audible. It, well, it's on Amazon, Audible, and the Library for the Blind. When you pick this book up, and you own, I've only read the first two chapters, okay? In the first two chapters, what this woman has accomplished in her very, very young life is pretty amazing. And then the other cool thing, the book comes with Braille. Um, I don't know if you can see that, but I tried to read the first word in Braille. Yeah, that's not happening. And so... Uh, <laughs> I told Gail, there is no way that's happening, but I'm so excited for, for Gail to be here because her story is freaking amazing. And for those of us who go around our lives doing, you know, I can't do this because of this, or I can't because of this, Gail, what do you say? I say you can do anything, everything, anything and everything is possible. There's nothing you can't do. One of my sayings is your desire to fly has to be bigger than your fear of falling. So your desire to do anything has to be bigger than whatever the fear is. And it's, of course, I have lots of analogies of that. One of them's like crossing a street. So for me being blind crossing the street, is there fear? Yeah, I'm going to be hit by a car. No matter if I had a dog or a cane, either way, crossing the street is scary. Now, my, but my desire to get to the other side has to be bigger than that fear. And some days, depending, I could ask for help to get across the street, especially if there's rain out there, which would be like another obstacle or something. And then some days I feel like, woohoo, I can conquer anything and I'll cross the street. But at any rate, my desire to cross it still has to be bigger. And it doesn't matter how I do it, hopefully with grace and dignity and honor and all that, that the important thing is that I get across the street. So my desire to fly has to be bigger than whatever the fear is. 
or else I'm not going to do it. Well, and then everybody. Yeah. I mean, I think, oh, I think that's but to think about, um, you have a story in your book when you were a little girl going into the basement and it was already a scary place. And well, oh shoot, now I just forgot what I was going to talk about, but just the navigation. So when you were younger, you could see like shadows and things like that, right? Right. Yeah, I had partial sight. And oh, go ahead. I don't know. Um, I was trying to figure out where you were going to go with that. Yeah, navigating was challenging, but you know, I still did. I didn't like it. I hated it. Oh, I hated the basement. Um, and psychologically and physically, you know, it wasn't it wasn't a safe place. So yeah, I chose not to go down there. Yeah, <laughs> both of us yeah. slight don't like going in the basements either. So don't feel bad about that. Yeah. Mm. No, and. Yeah. Well, it's just that you had so many, you have so many stories about all the different obstacles that have come in front of you. And one of the parts of your story that really kicked on me was, you know, we all hear something when we're younger that defines us and we allow it to define us. And we, we, we hold it into our adulthood of what we can and cannot do by something that happened when, let's say we were six. And with you, you had partial sight and you, what the doctor said, your, your, your vision is going to keep going. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you knew what was coming ahead of you and just that fear alone of knowing what was coming. I mean, just think of how many of us, we put that, the obstacle on the other end, it, it's not even going to happen in our world. There's no, uh, no guarantee, but we put obstacles in front of us in our path and say, because of this one little thing that happened when I was younger, I can never get past this. I mean, you're eight years old being told you're going to be totally blind. Actually, I don't know if I knew. You, you know, my, my parents knew, but I don't know if I knew. And I, I talk about like mind shifts and things. I would say one of my first, there were probably a lot of it. And I thought of myself as a traumatized baby, a wounded child. Um, in these are the big sections of my book, um, invisible adolescent, singing star, inner traveler, transition warrior and light giver. So the childhood was definitely a wounded child perspective and going in from that to invisible into adolescent where, where I was totally depressed and wanted not to ever be seen. But between the worlds of being having partial sight and going totally blind, which took about three months with cataracts and stuff. I still didn't know what was going on. And I still thought, um, was this real or was this not real? And that could be like with obstacles too. Was, can I see, can I not see? Because our internal vision is located in the same part of our brain as our external vision is in the brain. And so to me, as my outer vision diminished, my inner vision increased. But I still didn't know, am I blind? Am I sighted? What am I? I don't know. And, and all of a sudden, I'm running into walls. And we can look at that from a psychological perspective. And all, so I had to prove to myself one day, do I see or do I not see? And the only way I could do that was I, you'll get to that in chapter whatever, is that I, I, um, I drew my name on a page and I drew a line down from my name to the bottom of the page. And I thought, well, if I could see that line, then I know I have sight. But if I can't, then I know I don't. And I couldn't see the line. And that was my a real defining uh, moment for me because I nobody had to tell me that because my parents were in denial. They, they, they weren't saying I did or didn't see and they denied that I ever saw. Or they would say, why are you running into that? You know, you can see. Like, what's wrong with you? It's like totally weird. It's like you can't see, you can't see. Yeah, it totally mixed messages. And, um, or you'll be the best piano player in the world. You'll be a Rubenstein. Oh, but you're nothing at all. So I always got these mixed messages. And, but right then in that moment of drawing that line, I knew I couldn't. And that was, that was devastating, I must say. And when I looked it up later on Louise Hay, for people who know her book with um, You Can Heal Your Life, it says something about, I could go grab it if I really wanted to, um, but it says, 
something like fear of the future, not wanting to see what's in front of you. And I think psychologically for me, not wanting to see my parents, not wanting to see that I moved into this big house that a million millionaire father had just built that I hated because it was a disconnect. It was, it was, it was the, the focus was on the wrong thing and I hated it. And I think I didn't want to live that life. And so psychologically, which people will think was crazy and weird, I think I closed my eyes so I wouldn't have to see that. <laughs> <laughs> so. That is funny, actually. Well, yeah. and what, when I first met you, I said, um, from just a little bit of conversation we had was that for someone who can't see, you see clearer than anybody I've ever met. Yeah, I don't think vision is physical. I think it's internal. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, and that's why I wanted you on, because there's so many people right now who are having so much hardship going on in their lives and not seeing a, 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 an end or not believing that there is anything. And there's there's a quote saying, uh, we don't fear the unknown. We fear what we believe we know of the unknown. Mm -hmm. And for being someone who you navigated the world in you know darkness for your whole adulthood. I mean, but you are accomplishing and moving and shaking mountains and and breaking things, breaking you know barriers because you are not defined by what people are calling. What do they call it now? It, a, a dis? No, no, they're not calling it a disability anymore. Are they calling it? That's right. Yeah, it's not a oh. disability. You, it's an ability because you have. Right shifted the way maybe it's differently abled i don't know god only really knows what today's newest term is <laughs> I, i'm also I, i've heard it said print challenged it's like yeah i'm print challenged and every other ch print challenged like there's no part of reading print am i going to be do, doing here but yeah, you know there's there's six before the pandemic there was 60 percent unemployment in the visually impaired community or blind so now I imagine it's back up to 90 or 100. And it's so interesting to me that people complain. And I know you're out of job, people. I know. I know it's scary. I know it's hard. I mean, I don't know because I'm not in your shoes exactly. But in a way, 15% unemployment or 10% unemployment would be a blessing for those of us who are totally blind. You know, 60%, there's no reason for that. You know, and it's... Um, you know, and it's all because people don't think we can do the same as other people can do. And we don't do it the same as, we do it different than, but we still get it accomplished at the end of the day. And if I were wearing makeup today, I'd be putting it on differently, but I'd have it on, you know. But I didn't think you all would want to see that, so I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> but I will. I will. I'm going to conquer that one. I was talking to myself this morning saying, you're going to do that. But it's, it's, it, you gotta, you know, you can't, I was telling somebody the other day, you can't live in the past. You can't say, oh, I want the job I had before the pandemic and I want to be able to do that. You know, none of us are the same as we were before. And it's, you have to embrace the now and go into the future with the now and do that instead of holding on to the past. You feel that the holding on is what's going to keep you from the present or the future. Yeah. So and so I'm doing podcasts. I'm writing blogs. Have I ever done any of that? No. But am I willing to do it? Yes. Because I want to live my dream. I want to touch people's lives. I want to make a difference, to inspire you. That you can do whatever it is you say you want to do. And it's only your it that's getting in your way. Yes. And we've got a couple of people online right now. And some of them I can't read. It's too long. <laughs> But, but I've got, I got, I can see the insight. It's not physical sight, but that, that there's an insight. And if you're out there listening and you're watching, tell us where you are and um, say hi to Gail because I can read them out to her. And um, I, I just, I just, I really want you to get the book because <laughs> well, the cover of your book has Miss Colorado on the cover. Oh, that's true. Can you that's tell true. us that? Yeah, so the the things that, um, I mean, there's all kinds of defining moments in my life. So when I was in college, again, a master's in music, um, I sung the leading roles in two operas. I was Mimi in La Boheme, and I was Violetta in La Traviata. 
And then later, I built my own Habitat for Humanity house and this the book, and then Miss Colorado Senior America. And I was also fourth in the country uh, with the national Miss Senior America pageant. So when I was a mere 55 years old, I had a friend that came up to me and said, how old are you? And I told her, and she goes, oh, you're not old enough yet. And I went, okay, fine. Whatever that means, so I don't know. So five years later, um, she sent me this email, said, apply for this pageant thing. And I went, huh, I, I can't afford it, it delete. And then she emailed me and said, did you do that? No, I can't afford 150 bucks for the application, forget it. So, which wasn't in my highest good, but she said, "Never mind, we got that waived, you're doing this. And I went, okay. So my whole thing is to inspire people to live a life of greatness. I don't care if it's through my writing or singing or chatting or whatever it is. I want to lift you up the, for you to be your, I don't want you to be a victim anymore of your circumstances. I want you to be empowered by them. That's my whole thing. So I entered this contest, not because I thought I was a beautiful 36, 24, 36, but because I wanted to inspire you to live your dreams. So I entered the contest and here's the deal. I had to, there were 11 people in Colorado that um, applied for that. I, I'm one of them. And I had to work, I don't know, maybe a hundred times harder than this, the people that had site work because I, I so I thought you smiled like this, and I'm not sure, you know. And so I had to learn that you had to smile with your teeth, you know, your mouth open, and you turn your teeth. I didn't know that. How do I know that? I don't see people smile. You know, I don't know what you all do. So I had to learn that. I had to learn how to walk the queenly walk. I had to learn how to wave like a queen. You know? <laughs> I see. I got. I can do it two hands too. Ooh, <laughs> I go. Parallel or you know contrary motion doesn't matter. <laughs> but um, I had to learn. I had. I wanted to be better than my sighted co competitors, so I could be equal to. I didn't want to be seen. I didn't want to be seen. Here's a big distinction. I didn't want to be seen as the contestant who is the blind contestant. I wanted to be seen as the contestant who happened to be blind. So and there's a big difference there. And so I practiced hours and hours and hours learning how to walk, learning how to turn. And as the picture of the book shows, I had my fourth CNI dog on the cover, uh, Sir Vinny the Great. And I had to learn how to do all that with him there. There's a dog. Then, huh? I showed you dog. Oh, my dog, Vinny. And, uh, and, and how to do all that. He couldn't guide because he can't, he couldn't guide to a little X on the floor. So... You know, we had to practice doing, I had a sighted person assist me doing, guiding me, but yet he was still there. And then she would step back when I did my philosophy, when I did um, my talent, when I did evening gown and, and then meet the judge. My philosophy, maybe this will be interesting to folks, and it's in there, I'm sure, several places. But the philosophy says, my desire to fly must be bigger than my fear of falling. Vision is internal, not external, and is guided by my heart not my eyes. In order to be free to fly, I must want my dream, feel my dream, and believe that my dream will come true. Most importantly, I must live my dream. I'm the creator of my destiny, the composer of my symphony, and I choose to live a life of greatness. So that's my 30 sec 35 second philosophy. <laughs> so, I, so I won Miss Colorado. And then I went on to nationals and I had to get a different guide to help me with that. And I became, I was fourth runner up in the nationals. Oh, that's the end of the book. Spoiler for you. Oh, too bad oh. I said that. Oh. oh, well. Well, I'm curious uh, if you want to share, how did you get this, the, the title of your book, Soaring into Greatness? Because I see on the top, it says, a beautiful story of someone who has overcome a physical handicap and changed it into a force that is an inspiration to many people, President Jimmy Carter. And then it says, Soaring into Greatness. Where did you get that name? You know, I love to fly. My, my grandma gave me, a, way back in the day, it was called Records, Vinyls, they call them nowadays, of Jonathan Livingston Siegel. And maybe because I'm blind, I thought, wow. 
that must be really pretty to see. I mean, to fly. Well, I understand. And Jonathan says, one of, one of the cool quotes he says is, um, oh, your whole body from wingtip to wingtip is nothing more than a thought in a form you can see. Break the chains of your thoughts and you break the chains of your body too. And I thought, wow. I, mean, I think that was my first, one of my first little mind shifts. Um, but that, that, that is really powerful. So when it came to the title, I first thought about my grandma, which I really love that I thought of about naming it something like, I don't know, on wings of love. Cause that had still had wings in it. And I just like flying. And then I had soul eyes for a while. Cause I thought I wanted to see from my soul and I want others to see from their souls. But then somehow flying, I, you know, I don't know if I Googled it or what, you know, soaring felt better than flying and great, you know, and my last section of my book is light giver. And I don't know, I just wanted people to live a life of greatness, something beyond who they think they really are. And probably beyond who I think I am at times. You know, that we all have that ability to soar and to, to be better than we are. Well, and I love that you talk about choice a lot in that. I love that quote, break the chains of your thoughts, break the chains of your, your body. body too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, that was we've got a couple of people who are saying hi to you and um, congratulations on Miss Colorado. Oh, and Richard, Richard's the reason we even met. Richard says uh, Gail Hamilton is the other great Hamilton. <laughs> oh, ha, ha, ha. Uh -huh. I think he's referring to the movie. Yeah, yeah. Or well, it could be Daphne Hamilton, the one, the uh, surfer that has one arm. Yeah. But I think, or the other Hamilton, the president. There you go. There's a lot of us that it's are really like Hamilton, the play, uh, the musical. Yeah, I think that's why he was referring to. He's being funny. Yeah, the um, the mind shift though, really. I did lots. I, you know, I've I've had a hard life. Um, you know, there's abuse in my childhood. There's depression in my teenage years. Suicidal ideation in my uh, later on, and um, much less five dogs dying and such things and life that throws at you. But my shift came, because I know that was where you're gonna go eventually. Maybe yeah. not, but you haven't read the book, so you don't know what a shift is. Um, but the real shift for me was when my therapist said, what are you gonna do with yourself? And I said, well, I wanna write a book and become famous. And she said the famous answer that therapists always say, which is, I see, which means you're full of beans. <laughs> How are you gonna do that? You know, and I go, I don't know, you know. So she said, what are you going to, you know, what's preventing me from writing the book right then? And I said, nothing. But before that, I read a great book by, and I always tell people you can buy two books. You can buy my book and you can buy Lynn Grabhorn's book, Excuse Me, Your Life is Waiting. Because for me, that's where the shift happened. And of course, there's been years of therapy before that. But when I read Lynn's book, Excuse Me, Your Life is Waiting, I got it that what's in my head is really powerful. And that what I think, so I create it. And that's when I built, once I shifted my mind, that's when my I got the Habitat for Humanity house and wrote the book and became Miss America. That's when I really changed. But it was the belief that, for my example, the Habitat house, only I think 600 people apply for a year in Denver for a house, but only 30 people get one. And before I read that book, I would have said, um, there's no way I'm getting one. But once I read the book, I said, oh, 30 people is going to get one. Why not me? And I was one of those lucky 30 people. So it was, you know, it was a totally different mind shift. And I truly believe that what I think of and what I say of and what other people say totally um, creates the world and their destiny and how they're living their life. And um, discrimination can be very subtle, but it's it's out there. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of now about counting people out. I like, you know, like, your, your words are saying this, but you're meaning that. So uh, you have to be authentic with yourself. Yeah, you have to be yeah. true to your friend. Yeah, and that, and that philosophy that I gave while ago, that 35 seconds, that's not just a thing I said for the pageant. I truly believe every word of that that I wrote. And that's why I still remember it seven years later, because that's totally who I am. It's your mantra. It is. Yeah. I love it. Well, and, and that's why 
Well, man, I, well, one, you're silly. And and two, you like to break out in song. That, that kind of is our tie right there already. But <laughs> but Gail, Gail is a, she's a speaker. She goes around and she shares her story. She breaks into songs. She plays piano. She tells jokes. I mean, she is freaking hilarious. And she's being really, really like calm right now. But <laughs> I forgive her for that because she's like, Michelle, what are you doing? Putting me on live? What? What are we doing? <laughs> they say you're getting gun shy on me. But but that's what's so cool about Gail. I mean, listen to that mantra. Just listen to how how she looks at life, how she looks at life, not with her eyes, but she truly sees life in the world the way honestly I think we are, it sounds really bad coming out, but we're crippled through our sight because right. when we look at the right. world, we do this is this, this is that, black is white, white is black. I mean, we go through and we we separate things out because we see with our eyes. But if we can just shut up and back up and see with our hearts and our, our souls and, and hear and, and listen to what people are saying, we would see the truth rather than see the farce that's actually in front of us. Yeah. And so Absolutely. when I met Gail, that was what I was telling you. I said, you, I said, I, I know you don't have sight, but my goodness, at this point in, in, in our lives, you know, you have a benefit because you're not looking in a mirror doing, well, I'm not looking, I, I don't look like this. And I don't look like that beating yourself up. You know, you don't, you I, don't have, I have no idea what I look like. Just saying, just saying, you're I mean, in a way, you know, I have no idea. I mean, I, I know what the 11 year old looked like before she lost sight, but I have no idea. I don't, even, I don't even know if I focus on that. No, and that's that's where I see the blessing. So many of us are stuck on what we can and cannot do by the image we see. I right. mean, and that's where I found a commonality with you. There was so much in my life I didn't do because I thought I was too heavy or I wasn't the right color or my hair wasn't straight enough. You know, I looked at myself, categorized myself because of what I saw in movies and then didn't allow myself to grow as a human because of it. Right. And I cannot be the only one who's doing that. And so when I met yeah. you and we were talking, I went, wow, you're blind and you see. I'm I can see, but I've been blind for 40, you know, 50 years of my right. life. Right. And, and right. what a what a blessing it is to actually see for real. You have, oh, as Tara Lynn said, you have vision, which many of us lack. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 do. I think Helen Keller kind of said that, too. She said something like, you know, just because you have eyes doesn't mean you, you see. It was more eloquently worded. but And I say it, too. Yeah, just because there's a lot of blind people out there that are running into walls that they mostly put up themselves. Sometimes I look at it like being blind is, um, and I don't know if very many of you can relate to this, but, um, but being blind let's say I run into a chair and so I can tap that chair with my cane, which is a tool, which is an obstacle. And I can just notice that the chair is there and I can walk around it, which is probably a good choice for me to do or, but in my previous days, I may not even have noticed the chair. So I could be blind to the chair. I could run into the, I may not even have used my cane and just blindly, so to speak, <laughs> fallen over that chair. Um, so a lot of people do that, you know, they just, they just go forward and just trip over things and then they blame the chair for being there in the first place. Well, it wasn't the chair's fault that it was there. You know, it was just hanging out. You could ask for help to move the chair. Some people do that. You know, you can go under it you can go around it. You can go over it. You can be angry at it. You could be afraid of it. Oh my God, there's a chair in my way. What do I do? <laughs> you know, it's just so many things you could do that chair. Uh, you can deny his existence. You can, um, you know, but it, so just, but the, the best way to get around the chair, the obstacles in life is to notice it, to face it, to acknowledge it, and then to choose how you want to handle that chair. Do you want to get help with it or do you want to go around it? You know, and we all do different things at different times. And, but you got to do those things. Boom. Oh, Boom. That was it. You like that? Well, because so many people get stuck on something. They're like, oh, my oh, God. Oh, something will sit on the chair and don't do anything. Yeah. You sit on the chair. There's an obstacle. I'm just going to sit on it or I'm yeah. just going to stand behind it. 
And that's exactly what I love to talk about is you have a choice in your life. And it right. doesn't matter what is put in your way. It doesn't matter, like in your sight, in your, you, you lost your sight. It doesn't matter. You do what you want to do by your your standard. Just because, let's say, like Gail said in, in the pageant, she couldn't do what all those other pageant people did, but she had to work her way around to do the same thing, but she still did it. Well, when yeah. you find a, a chair in the middle of the room and it, if you hit it, you don't do, oh, I hit a chair. I can't move anymore. There's nothing I can do about it. You, know, you do either you pick up the chair, you move it, or you learn the diameter of the chair and do, okay, I'm going to go around it, over it, under it, you know, or I'm just going to pick it up and throw it out the window, like Jennifer says. And, right. you know, just right. do something. But right. if you sit there and complain about the chair, um, the chair isn't going to willingly move on its own. You no. must do something with that obstacle in your life to get through it. And that's right. why I was encouraging everyone to pick up Gail's book or get the audio because this woman has gone through so many hurdles, so many chairs, actually in your case, so many boulders yeah. in your way, and you yeah. found ways around it. And yeah, there are people who have hangnails and can't get past it. Oh, I know. And yeah. so that's why I wanted to share you with you, share live, wanted you live, because I wanted people to be able to ask questions because, you know, there's like a question I've always had for anyone who does not have sight is when you're in a room that you, you get comfortable with, do you remember the diameter of that chair? Do you know about two steps to the right? There's a couch from there. I mean, do you have a mental picture of what that feels like? I mean, how do you navigate? I do. I mean, I have a, I have, because I'm a visual learner, which is weird because a lot of people go, what? Are you having your blind eye? But because I'm visual, um, I image everything. So when I go into a building, when I do walk into a room, I, yeah, I pretty much know where everything is after I once learn it. Um, and then I'll forget that I'm blind and then I'll trip over and go, oh, Damn, still blind. Because <laughs> I forget. Because in my head I see, and I, which is really weird. And what's weird, because then people that I'm around who do have sight, they want to help me do every single little thing. It's like, no, I got it. I've I've been here once before. I I, I and it's in my head forever. I know how to walk into. I could probably walk into any place I've been to in the past and do it because I don't know. It's in my head. It's in my memory. It's. It's there. I don't need somebody to tell me every single time, here's how I do something, you know, how I walk down the hallway. It's ingrained in me. So I do visualize everything. Okay. Yeah. For well, me. Gerline uh, wrote, Gail knows how to condition the mind and rule the world. It takes I like a that. choice. Yeah, I like it too. It takes a choice to live better and in a promising way. Nice. Rule the world. I know. Oh. Rule, rule. Ooh. Well, and, and back to what you said about you have friends who'd like to t uh, do everything for you. And, and you're like, wait a minute, I've got this. Now, think yeah. about how many, for those of you who are watching, how many times in your life, um, or if you have children or you have you know someone who in your life that you are constantly hovering around, you are not doing any benefit for them when you are constantly doing everything for them because really... They want to do it on their own. Even if Absolutely. they say they don't, they really want really to. I love, I'm, sorry people out there, I like running into walls. I like, you know, because then I get to see the world. It's okay with me to feel where the door is and the handle. It's, what do you think I do when you're not around? I still run into walls. Of, it's, and it's, it's not shaming to me. It's okay to be blind. It's a blessing. It's not a curse. And I I like it. Now, the only thing, if I ask you for help, if I'm, um, you know, yeah, if I ask for help, or then it's okay to give it to me. But otherwise, let me blindly run into stuff. Because it's the only way I'm going to see and learn and grow and evolve to the person I want to be. Unless it's a matter of safety. If you see that I my cane really didn't pick up that flight of stairs and I really am about to fly down at head over heels, please stop me from killing myself. Yeah, that but is. Otherwise, yeah. But otherwise, let me go. It's okay. 
But that's what that and that's and, what. And even if I fall down the flight of stairs, it's not your fault. Oh, yeah. It's me and my cane. Yes. Unless you knew about it beforehand, you didn't step up. You know, then maybe it is kind of your responsibility. Well, and then back to the whole analogy, everything you talk about is such a is such a great analogy for just everybody. Because people are like, oh, but I don't want my baby to fail, or I don't want my so-and-so to fail. No, failure is good. Failure it's is not failure. failure. No, if you're learning, it's yeah. not a failure. Let them fall. Or in my case, I say, let me fall. I'll bounce and I swear I'll bounce higher. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. It's okay. Yeah. Now, let me see. What else? What can I pull out of this book? Um, I don't know. Okay. I'm going to read your back. Okay. Born 10 weeks premature and requiring oxygen to survive, Gail Hamilton's first six weeks of life began within an incubator. Six months later, doctors discovered that Gail had, oh my gosh, how do you say that? Red aphasia or retinopathy of prematurity nowadays. An eye condition caused by the infusion of 100% pure oxygen. By age 11, she was completely blind. Soaring into greatness uh, follows Gail's story as her outer visual world merged with her inner vision, forcing her to listen with her inner voice, to follow her heart and tune into her intuition. Subjected to physical and emotional abuse, ostracized and oftentimes feeling alone, Gail's journey to one of, is one of the courage and perseverance it takes to find one's way through the darkness and soar. That is such a beautiful description of your life. And for what all of us are doing in this world is to find the courage and the perseverance to find our own way through whatever our darkest hours are. I know. And you can do it. Be because, and how do I know it? People say, how do you know? Because you've done it before. You know, I, I can remember, I don't know which time, what our time is, but I can remember when I ended a relationship and I can remember sobbing on the floor for 45 minutes crying, and I remember saying to my dog at the time, God, they should take a picture. I, I'm so pathetic. Blah. And that was probably one of the hardest moments in my life, ending that relationship. And, and so then when time came along for maybe my parents to pass away, or maybe for my eyes to be removed, or uh, financial hardships, or whatever, or even now, I know I'm okay because I've done the hard, you know? Even with my last C&I dog, Sarge, who is not in the book, unfortunately, but had to be retired suddenly because some silly lady in the middle of downtown Denver decided to let her dog attack him in the middle of the street. That was devastating. That was devastating. I still miss him. And it's still not fair that he's a police dog now instead of being my C&I dog. But I know I can go through all that because I've done all the other hard and I know I'll make it through this too and hopefully get my dog number six here soon. And again, another question you leave us with because whatever hardship you're facing, whatever is going on in your life, search your memory. I can assure you, you have seen this kind of a pain in some sort, way, shape, or form. Let your brain realize that it's been there before and it's made it before in another in another uh, venue, basically, another circumstance. We'll make it again. And so Gail is just a plethora of life lessons and everything that comes out of her mouth, even when she's laughing or, you know, giggling at me, it, there's always a lesson that comes out. Gail. And so I, I urge you to connect with her, grab her book, get the audio book if you want, because uh, unless you're a really good reader, um, I'm a really good reader, but I've been really busy. I promise, Gail, I will. And, but you can also find her book on the at the Library for the Blind. And if you know anybody who is struggling or has just recently lost their sight, needs some encouragement of, this is going to be just fun. Get her book for them. It'll be a, a great Go to her website. It's www.soaringintogreatness.com and reach out to Gail. And if you are a 
hosting any kind of speaking events online or you know, virtual eventually, you want to reach out to Gail because she is holding back with me right now. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 usually, we're usually bantering back and forth. And, but I want, I'm really encouraging all of you to reach out because she is just an amazing speaker, a wonderful human, and there's nothing that comes out of her mouth that isn't some sort of a life lesson that we all need to hear. And right now we all need to hear Gail. Sweet. <laughs> so Gail, what, what words of wisdom would you like to share with us? Because that your, your thingy that you shared about, I believe my desire to fly, fly must be bigger than my fear to fall. Do you have another bit of wisdom you'd like to share? We are almost out of time. Um, change the way you see, change the way you wear. That's one of my other things. Change the way, I've got that one. Change the way you see, change the way you live. So simple, but this is Gail. Change the way you see, change the way you live. I love it, Gail. Me too. <laughs> well, and I'm putting her website here just in case you didn't catch it. It's soaringintogreatness.com. And I, I sincerely ask you to you know, find Gail, look her up, and uh, track her. She's not much of a social media human, but uh, if you go to her website, grab that book, you learn so much. She shared so much in this book. She is literally the open book. And um, if you've got anyone that, that needs someone to come out and speak uh, or go on to the, one of their online platforms, we can get Gail easily into one of your platforms to share because the world needs encouragement and um, Gail is walking encouragement. She is walking inspiration. And I, I encourage you to grab, grab a hold of her while you can because she's about to get really busy. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Well, Gail, thank you so much for joining me today and joining all of us today. And thank you everyone for coming online and saying hi and dropping out all those beautiful uh, comments to Gail and um, Gerlene, Jennifer, Terlin, and you know all of you who are watching the replay. Thank you. Please like, share, um, repost, whatever you need to do to get the message out that Gail is out. And if she's got this in the bag, we we can do this. And when you see someone who's running around struggling, it's okay. Let them struggle a little bit, unless it's dangerous, then help, okay? But um, Gail, you rock, lady. Thank you, you rock too. And I wish I could have got you to sing and play a piano, but that'll have to be another another saying. Another day. Another day? Another day. Someday you'll sing on my show. That will be fun. <laughs> Yay! She's an awesome singer, by the way. So have a great day, everybody. And Gail, thank you so much for joining us. And until next time, everybody, you be unapologetically you. And remember what Gail says, change the way you see, change the way you live. Until next time, be the best versions of you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>